مستك عبد الرحمن ان انت لخصت الموضوع من الاخر يعني اول لا حاجه تيك هوم اوكي ثانيه واحده سو جود ايفنينج اجين ايفري ون This is our uh, third live uh, streaming by Cardiology Education Channel, actually. We're happy to have you all with us uh, on the Zoom link and on uh, the YouTube live. We're streaming on our channel now. You have the link. I posted it on the page. You need to click and you will be live with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Saeed will be managing the YouTube questions today. So he will be with you. You can interact there live, ask your questions, and he will convey your questions and they will be answered also. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Abrahman Gamal. He's a consultant at the National Heart Institute and he's a member of our board. He will speak with us about uh, non-ST elevation at your coronary syndrome. And this will be followed by an interactive uh, case-based discussion by uh, Dr. Haytham Suleiman Gharib. He is a lecturer of cardiology and consultant of interventional cardiology at Fayoum University. Our distinguished panel today includes uh, Professor Ahmed Shawi as a moderator. He's my senior and my friend and my colleague and my brother and my role model. And I'm always happy and gladly honored to have him with us actually. He will be moderating the first part of the session with Dr. Abrahman Gamal and he will also continue the moderation throughout the session. Also, I have my dear friend, Bert brother, colleague, also Abdullah Al-Maghrabi from Alexandria University, and uh, he's a board member of the EAC uh, International Young Academy of Cardiology as well. Uh, Abdullah will moderate the second part involving the cases with uh, Dr. Haytham Suleiman. So uh, I think we're streaming perfectly now on YouTube. I got, uh, I got the, the message that we're doing very well there. So we can start now. And uh, Dr. Abrahman, this is your screen. You can start, please. Uh, sorry for uh, the net problems. I think I was disconnected. You can start, you can start sharing your okay. screen again, no worries. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I wish uh, you are all safe. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Gamal. I'm a consultant of cardiology, National Heart Institute, Egypt. We will talk today about the uh, non-ST acute coronary uh, syndrome, uh, a case-based uh, presentation uh, with uh, 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 more, uh, which will be more uh, towards the intervention. When should we rush to the uh, cat lab in such patients? Our case today is a male patient, 45 years old. He's hypertensive, a smoker, presented with typical chest pain uh, uh, with uh, onset of three hours uh, and then the patient uh, came to the ER. His vital signs was uh, uh, stable, uh, uh, normal vital signs at this uh, time of presentation. His ECG showed uh, um, nothing significant, uh, just a poor R wave progression across the pericordial leads. Uh, his echo uh, showed a uh, uh, resting segmental wall motion abnormalities in the form of hypokinesia of mid and basal anterior and anteroceptal segments with a uh, fair ejection fraction of 55. Um, his labs shows nothing uh, uh, significant, but only his troponin was positive. So, uh, our working diagnosis was non-ST acute coronary syndrome. Uh, 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 may I ask you all, what is the next step you think we should uh, uh, go for this patient? Uh, can I have answers or votes? Hello. And this is Ahmed Shawi. Um, uh, just uh, a good evening to everybody, and it's a pleasure being here with everybody. It's a pleasure to the board. I thank them very much for uh, inviting me, and it's an honor. Very good case, very common case scenario. We see Dr. Abdurrahman. Yes. Uh, yes, Dr. Rahman, this is a, a very common case scenario uh, with uh, uh, most of. Uh, of us, uh, either uh, consultants uh, 
or even uh, even uh, uh, residents uh, will easily diagnose this patient. Uh, what is the next step for such a patient? What's the next step for such a patient? So far, a lot of people have answered for stratification of the risk of this patient. But of course, uh, you're the one leading the way. We'll see what you're going to say. Okay. Uh, the initial assessment of such a patient uh, of acute coronary syndromes uh, ranges from uh, the low likelihood to the high likelihood regarding the presentation, ECG, troponin, and diagnosis. Presentation from the mild localized chest pain and up to cardiac arrest, which raises the likelihood uh, ECG from normal, completely normal ECG and up to ST elevation, either transient or resistant elevation of, of ST segment. Uh, trobonin from negative to uh, a highly positive trobonin. So we have a, 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 a wide variety uh, begins from the non-cardiac causes of chest pain and up to uh, STEMI uh, diagnosis. Uh, this is uh, 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 a very famous slide uh, from uh, the guidelines of uh, non-ST acute coronary syndrome. It is an old guideline uh, from 2015. And by the way, uh, this year, uh, most probably we, we, we were waiting the new guidelines of uh, non-ST uh, elevation ACS. Uh, it, it was supposed to be uh, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, however, this acute chest pain uh, flow chart, uh, high sensitive uh, cardiac trombonins, either uh, uh, less than the upper limit of normal or more than the upper limit of normal. It is the uh, rule of zero and three hours uh, recheck of the trombonins. And as you see, uh, the invasive uh, strategy, uh, if we have a, a significantly high, high sense of trombonin uh, and uh, typical presentation, this arrow will be the invasive management. Uh, if it is lower than uh, the upper limit of normal, we will check on uh, about three hours. Uh, if the pain uh, is persistent for more than six hours and the, our patient is pain free, he will be discharged and, will, uh, and, and we will uh, do stress testing for him. And following the chronic uh, chronic syndrome guidelines. Um, so what's the next step? The first response of surgeon to hemorrhage is compression. And the first response for us to an ST elevation acute coronary syndrome is, in one word, is risk stratification. So why risk stratification? Because it will impact the decision making regarding the treatment option, either uh, uh, medical, invasive, and if it is invasive, which time frame should we rush to the cath lab? This is the latest uh, uh, slide from the guidelines of 2018, revascularization guidelines in non STEMI patients, and it determined a very high risk criteria uh, for the patients who uh, should go for immediate invasive strategy within two hours, uh, you have to uh, uh, answer six questions uh, to put your patient in this category. If this patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, does he or she has uh, uh, electrical instability? Is there is mechanical complications, acute heart failure, persistent chest pain, uh, although uh, uh, full medical treatment, and recurrent dynamicity. These are the six high risk, very high risk criteria. Uh, the second category is the high risk criteria. Uh, uh, positive troponin is a, a high risk criterion. Dynamicity uh, is high risk criterion. And uh, the uh, traditional GRACE score, uh, more than 140 is a high risk criterion. Uh, the third one is the intermediate uh, risk group and 
the fourth one is the low risk uh, group. This uh, Gris uh, risk score uh, is uh, of eight uh, variables. Uh, his, uh, this application is available uh, on iOS and uh, Android uh, systems. Uh, we can easily uh, uh, do it regarding uh, the age, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, congestive heart failure, creat, ST segment elevation, elevated trombonin, trombonins, and cardiac arrest. So, what do you think about risk stratification of our patients? Um, very good question. This is important, as you said, that risk stratification is important to assess what our patient will undergo. And this patient is not a very high risk category. This is a rather moderate or intermediate risk category. So what are you going to do? I, I would like to also to listen to the other participants because I, I, I have a feeling what I will, I will do. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, we want to hear from uh, our uh, friends sharing us uh, 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 this uh, patient uh, of which category uh, regarding the risk stratification. And upon so, that. Uh, so, Haytham, uh, Haytham, you are with us, and also Abdullah Al Maghrabi. I agree with Professor Shawi that this patient is a rather moderate risk patient uh, what do you think Haytham and then uh, after that give the mic to Abdullah what does he think um, I think that uh, yes this is a moderate risk patient uh, we have the algorithm for this patient to um, towards the invasive but not an early invasive strategy meaning um, it's not mandatory to intervene with this patient in, at the first 24 hour uh, regarding his stable uh, but eventually this patient will go for invasive strategy and not for uh, non-invasive or medical, me medical treatment. Uh, thank you, Haysam. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ahmed Chawi and Professor Mohammed Zahran. Uh, but may I uh, go back? Uh, may I uh, go back for this slide? The, this slide I don't know why, uh, Zahran. I don't know why uh, why I can't control the presentation. While you go to while you go to the slide, let me hear Abdullah's opinion about this uh, patient regarding uh, his please, risk. Please, please. And reshare your yeah, slides again. I don't have a different opinion than you because uh, I think that it is a moderate risk patient, as uh, you all said. So actually, so actually, if we have uh, a very high by which, by which we mean very high risk that he has some electrical or hemodynamic instability or persistent chest pain or transient ST elevation, those particular subsets of patients, we should go with what we know as the immediately invasive approach. Invasive, yeah. Yes, we will run with those patients with the cath lab in the first 120 minutes, just yeah. immediately like the primary PCI for the STEMI. Because we consider them as uh, YouTube, uh, we consider them as uh, as uh, an STEMI patients. But actually, we have the patients which are moderate and high risk, which would be also dealt with invasively, but not immediately invasive. We mean we can deal with them in the first 48 hours, and we have the subset which are low risk, discharged, and then they can do the non-invasive stress test to show what is the risk for further and geography if needed, and probable revascularization out of patient after their discharge. So you can proceed, Abrahman. We don't okay. want to interrupt you more because of the sake of time. So you can proceed. Uh, as we can revise here, our patient have almost no significant or dynamic ECG changes. He has a chronic one, most probably. Uh, just poor airway progression across, across the chest leads. But all the, the only significant uh, criteria we can uh, uh, see here is he has a positive trombonin. Uh, uh, all you said, my dear friends, uh, regarding the old guideline of 2015 of the non STEMI is correct. But the revascularization guidelines released uh, a few months ago, at 2018, 
2018, said that the uh, high risk criteria is one uh, just just a positive troponin is a high risk criteria. So as you see here, we have three high risk criteria rather than the very high risk criteria. The high risk criteria is dynamicity, positive troponin uh, uh, like our patient, and GRACE score more than 140. So our patient is a high risk patient. And we should go for early invasive strategy within 24 hours, less than 24 hours. So our patient is a high risk one. Why? Because he is only had positive troponins. Uh, uh, we will move to our uh, uh, classic uh, uh, steps regarding the antiplatelets and the anticoagulant. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, focus uh, on these points because uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Haysam uh, Suleiman, uh, will focus uh, upon these uh, points. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, this patient must be uh, uh, loaded with a B2Y12 inhibitor, uh, preferably uh, 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 take a glior. Uh, if this patient loaded with uh, uh, clobidogrel, uh, this slide uh, is always um, uh, misleading or uh, mm, uh, for most of us, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the in acute in the in acute setting and in chronic setting, uh, generally speaking, it is uh, not preferable to uh, do switching between different B2 to Y2 B2 to uh, Y12 inhibitors, except in uh, switching from uh, clobidogrel to uh, take a glioral. Uh, uh, general rules, uh, I will uh, uh, tell you, um, uh, may uh, simplify this uh, uh, diagram. Always in the acute setting, uh, it is class to, to be uh, to switch. Uh, uh, the only uh, uh, exception is from uh, clobido grail to take a glioral. Uh, always uh, reload. Uh, 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 always wait 24 hours, but also except in the uh, 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 situation between colubido grill and tagaglirol, we should reload uh, immediately uh, with uh, 180 uh, tagaglirol. In the chronic in the chronic setting, it is always to be uh, in all arms between the three. Uh, to be uh, between the B B2Y12 inhibitors, even between uh, uh, tagaglior to clobidogrel. I think this is the only situation uh, we might uh, switch between tagaglior because of bleeding uh, issues or intolerance of our patients. So we may switch or de-escalate to clobidogrel. If you want to de-escalate to uh, clobidio grill, please wait 24 hours. Please uh, don't uh, reload. This is okay. so here, uh, so here uh, I will ask uh, Professor Shawi because uh, I know the, he, he explained this slide to me several times previously in a much easier way. Uh, would you please, Professor, try to conclude uh, the important point that we need to know from this slide? The most important point here, and uh, thank you for this uh, uh, presentation. When you have an acute coronary syndrome, if you don't have ticagrel or, or prasugrel, you give clopidogrel. Otherwise, regardless the patient took clopidogrel or not, reloading with ticagrel is the only studied one to be given on top of a loading of clopidogrel. The other uh, uh, situations in which we change other P2Y12 have not been extensively studied. So only in acute coronary syndrome and the patient on clopidogrel, not on clopidogrel, and you have ticagrelor, two tablets of 90 milligrams, that's 180, and go ahead to the cath lab. Okay. Okay. Uh, but, but, uh, okay. okay, thank you, Professor Ahmed Chawi. You made it more easy. Uh, that's what uh, we, we, we have to do always. 
Um, I, I, I will not. Uh, uh, this is an old slide, also from uh, 2015. Uh, I will also. Uh, I will only mention the uh, the last uh, uh, statement uh, that it is not recommended to administer brazogrel in patients whom coronary anatomy is not known. Uh, does any one of you, uh, my dear colleagues, and I, I also want to hear from Professor Ahmed Chawi, why uh, this uh, 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 this statement or the guidelines is always aggressive to, towards giving prasugrel before the coronary angio? Um, very good question. I love the question. Um, actually, it's because of the cabbage-related bleedings that are increased by prasugrel uh, when patients were give, uh, went to cabbage. Of course. We don't see this a lot in our situations, in some places, because a few of the patients of acute chronic syndromes will end up in the cabbage. Even if we have uh, uh, highly complex lesions or proximal LADs, we usually do them with intervention. So prasugrel may increase in, uh, cabbage-related bleedings, and that's what the problem was in Triton. Yes, thank you, sir. Exactly what you say. We have a, a, a big study which de demonstrates that the uh, uh, mortality increased in the arm who received uh, brassograil before the coronary angio, mainly due to uh, surgery or due to cabbage referral of such a patient. We, uh, and we have a lot of these patients uh, 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 with multi-vessel disease, which is uh, 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 a common, not uncommon in our patients of, of these non stemi patients, most of them, or uh, maybe 50% of these patients is multi-vessel disease. Uh, are you agree with this, uh, Professor Ahmed Chawi? Um, a lot are uh, multi-vessel disease, and this causes a problem. Which one is the culprit? And here we are talking about what to do in revascularization and the uh, contrast load and the creatinine and so many things to put in perspective. I agree, yes. very good question. Yes, thank you. So our patient uh, uh, rushed to the cat lab in uh, uh, a time frame of uh, 24 hours. Uh, he has no uh, significant or dynamic ACH changes, only positive uh, trombonin. Uh, uh, ECO uh, was, uh, I have segmental wound motion abnormality in the LED uh, territory, and that is uh, his coronary angiography. As you can appreciate, we have a failing defect in the osteal uh, LED with TM3 flow in the LED. Uh, 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 this is most probably a thrombus protruding or encroaching uh, to the uh, distal uh, left main. This was a six French uh, diagnostic uh, catheter. The RCA, as you can see, have an intermediate uh, uh, lesion approximately. So our strategy is to to go for uh, seven French cheese uh, uh, with seven French XB3 guiding caster, two wires, hypercode guide wires, uh, to run through hypercode guide wires in LED and LCX. Uh, what do you think, Professor Ahmed, uh, regarding the uh, strategies uh, uh, bifurcation, an osteal, true osteal LED lesion with a thrombus with TM3 flow in the LED? What do you think? Okay, first of all, this is a young patient. I look at the patient in whole. I don't just look at the lesions, and this is important to take into consideration. This is young patient. So if this patient undergoes cabbage, yes, his uh, lima will live for maybe 10, 20 years, but then what we will do? His vein grafts will not live for so much and so much. The patient is in acute current syndrome, and I know from my uh, institute, very few surgeons will work upon this. I agree to what you're doing, intervention, Get ready, two wires, the biggest uh, guide that you have that can support your intervention. Excellent uh, idea to go. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. I think uh, I have the same way of thinking. Uh, maybe Lima or minimal invasive technique will be ideal, or uh, scientifically speaking, uh, will be ideal for this patient. But actually, uh, in most of, of our institutes uh, here, uh, no surgeon will go for a non-STEMI or STEMI patient 
also we have many situations we need uh, uh, an urgent cabbage for our patient. So I decided to go to uh, intervention, uh, one instant uh, strategy, uh, left main uh, LED, uh, I will put uh, a wire in the LCX and I will go for provisional uh, stenting to left main uh, LED. And that is what I have done. Uh, there is no uh, compromise, thank God, for the LCX. Uh, no Karina shift, uh, no black shift. Uh, this situation, uh, shall I go for bot or not? Oh, 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 I was going to ask this question, actually, because uh, we usually see this a lot. There is no left main, guys, whatsoever. That diameter is uh, 3.5 millimeters. So if you end up with the Timmy tree flow here and you take out everything and, and you go home, it would have been better if you not intervened at all. So uh, what I need to deliver here clearly, and I will not take a vote because this is not something to vote about. Uh, it's, uh, let's say it's a, a piece of crime if you not perform a, a very proper post dilatation for this stent that protrudes into the left main. And you need to take care properly that the part of the stent that's landing in the left main is at least equivalent to or longer than the shortest non-compliant balloon that you're gonna insert in this left main part of the stent to adequately oppose it against the vessel wall. I will ask uh, Professor Shawi if he agrees with me or if he needs to add another point. Uh, I agree totally. And again, uh, another um, just message here. Um, uh, Professor Abdurrahman uh, used here a femoral approach because he was acting on a left main with a seven French, which cannot be done radially and he wanted good support. But yes. if you have an acute crying syndrome and you are uh, having a good experience with radial, a radial here might decrease a little bit of the bleeding because of the heparins and the uh, du uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. But of yes. course, the win on the left main, I agree totally with Professor Zahran Taba. Yes, uh, totally agree, uh, Professor Ahmed Shawi. Uh, I usually, most of, of my cases, 99% uh, is radial, but fortunately, this patient, uh, uh, I uh, did it uh, through uh, uh, femoral approach. Uh, this uh, make it more easy uh, uh, to uh, replace the six French one by a seven French system. Uh, and as uh, my friend Mohammed Zahran mentioned, uh, to not do uh, a boat here is a crime because uh, this uh, proximal part of our catheter uh, by visual assessment is about uh, 2.5 millimeter diameter. And you can see this left main is about at least four to 4.5 4 uh, diameter. Uh, the stent we have is 3.5. Uh, uh, I don't have a 4.0 uh, 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 millimeter diameter stent. And the distal of uh, uh, distal uh, landing zone of my stent will be in the LED, which is uh, uh, also uh, a 3.5. So uh, we put a stent at 3.5 here. If we don't do both, for this left main, uh, most probably this patient will come again with uh, a subacute uh, or late stent thrombosis. Uh, and also, uh, uh, the osseum of this LCX most probably, most probably, uh, uh, will uh, uh, will have a problem maybe in the future. So, uh, fortunately, I have a, a, four, a, four, uh, a four by eight millimeter non-compliant balloon, which was enough to do an excellent uh, boat, as you see, and this was the uh, final result. Uh, our patient then uh, transferred safely to the uh, CCU with uh, a very good uh, uh, course in the CCU uh, for 48 hours. Uh, our long-term management, both uh, non-ST, uh, ACS, 
uh, all of us uh, know it uh, very well. I will not uh, go through it. Uh, um, regard, regarding the anticipated uh, uh, the medical treatment, um, the rehab, uh, etc., the LDL for this. Uh, yes. So while you put the take-home messages. Uh, where you actually are focusing on the proper timing of the intervention for those patients, uh, which, as we said, as you elegantly described previously, if the patient is a very high-risk patient, then you need to perform your intervention in the first two hours, while yes. if the patient is in the high risk, it's better to perform it in the first 24, and otherwise you can postpone it and you can do the non-invasive test for the low-risk patients. And this is the key about non-STEMI patients that you need to risk stratify them. You manage it, uh, your case uh, properly and efficiently in the cath lab. Maybe I would vote for using just a bigger balloon, but maybe sometimes you are cut down by your resources. I think you inflated yes. your balloon at the very yes, high. This is a very important, Zaron. I want to ask you about this. What do you think about the sizing? Sorry, about the, the sizing of the non-compliant balloon. Yes. And for how me, can I, we calculate I it? The, 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 you should, if you want to calculate it accurately, you're, yes, then you're going to use your IVUS. But if you don't have an IVUS because this is a critical situation, maybe it came at 3 or 4 a.m. and the IVUS was not available. So usually you, the, the left main size is two-thirds two the, the, uh, the additive sum of the LAD and the LCX. So let's see this uh, 3.25 multiplied by 2, so it's a 6.5 or 7. And you need the, the three over four, uh, the two, the two thirds of this was going to be more or less between a 4.5 just to an 0.2 above or an 0.2 below. So if you inflated your four millimeter balloons at 24 or 26, maybe you can get this or you can inflate a 4.5 or even five millimeter balloon. You did the case actually greatly. I'm so happy by this case. I would like uh, to give uh, Professor Ahmed Shawi one to two minutes to sum up the first half of the session while uh, Professor Haysam will uh, put the slides so you can stop okay. sharing the one because Haysam will start. Uh, uh, thank you, Saran. Uh, before oh. Professor Ahmed, I wanted to add another question to Professor Ahmed. If you have an IVUS at this time at the midnight, uh, w uh, would you uh, use it or not? Um, very good question. First of all, a congratulations on such a lovely case. Lovely Thank presentation you. of the guidelines, lovely presentation of every uh, step of the way. If I have Thank an you. IVUS in the middle of the night and I have an, uh, an unstable patient, I will never use it. I will not okay. waste the time of an unstable patient with an IVUS, but if the patient is stable and uh, sometimes we have it and we are going to do it, okay, that's not a problem. Because, of course, introduction of more and more equipment in a patient with a thrombus, which is a non-STEMI or a STEMI, you might produce a little bit more problem. But of course, according to the guidelines, it is better for unprotected left main to use IVUS or OCT to size your stent correctly and opposition. A perfect case, risk stratified patient. As uh, Professor Abdurrahman showed us, ECG chest pain, but of course, troponin and other things. The patient might seem as a moderate risk, but again, just the elevation and decline in troponin classified this as a high risk patient. So the patient will go earlier into invasive. More invasive than less invasive Dilwati. Nowadays, sorry, in, uh, in acute coronary syndromes. Number two, um, the best of the P2Y12 is ticagrelor. Of course, if you don't have it, that's another issue. And prasugrel is not preferred if the patient might be uh, going to surgery. And there was an excellent comment that prasugrel is very effective. Agree. But if the patient goes into surgery, it might be a problem. Then how to manage your patient if it's multi-vessel or single vessel? This is another uh, issue. And here it was perfectly done through a femoral approach, which I agree to totally because it's the seven French. We cannot do it radially. But if you can do it radially, of course, it's better in acute coronary syndromes. Dual antiplatelet therapy for one year, statins and high dose. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Uh, this is an excellent uh, example for how we do the sessions at the CEC. Uh, this is interactive sessions. We convey your questions and we have some experts on board actually inside the, the room with us. And as you see here, it's uh, somewhere interactive between the discussant, the moderator and the presenter. The second half of the session actually will be presented by Professor Haitha, my dear friend, colleague and co-founder of CEC. 
So Haytham will give us uh, actually some uh, specific case scenarios regarding the bleeding ischemia balance, a risk of benefit for every single patient. And this will be moderated by my dear and elegant friend, uh, Dr. Abdullah from Alexandria University and board member of EAC. So Haytham and Abdullah, uh, the mic is with you now. Thank you, dear uh, Muhammad. Um, I am very fortunate to, uh, to participate in this elegant meeting. Uh, and uh, I'm extremely lucky uh, to be uh, pro preceded by the presentation of uh, uh, Abdul Rahman, because uh, we will review uh, some of the concepts that Abdul Rahman have showed in his uh, presentation. Uh, and this will be uh, in the form of a case. We have a 78-year-old female patient, hypertensive for 20 years, diabetic for 15 years, anemic with a hemoglobin of 10. Um, she is uh, complaining of uh, coronary artery disease on medical treatment, known uh, uh, renal impairment with a creatinine clearance of 35. She had an old cerebrovascular stroke three years ago with no uh, residual neurological deficit. So she has every risk factor in the book. She came presented with a typical chest pain, high sense of troponin of 300. She was hemodynamically stable and blood pressure was 160 over 100. This is her CG showing a diffuse ST segment uh, depression with an ST segment elevation in AVR. And when we did her an echocardiography, the ejection fraction was 48. So we have a female patient, an old female patient, hypertensive, diabetic, cerebrovascular stroke, renal impairment, anemic, with heart failure, and now with non stemi so in your opinion, and this is a repeated question from the last presentation, do we need a risk stratification for this patient or the, the obvious situation of this patient and the obvious track uh, do not need a risk stratification? Abdullah, what do you think? Yeah, I think we need a risk stratification. We need to know what is uh, her uh, ischemic risk and also bleeding risk because uh, I think she is risky for bleeding. Um, I agree with you, but uh, some, uh, um, some other uh, colleagues might say that this is a very fragile patient. She has uh, multiple comorbidities with a stable condition. So let's go for uh, medical treatment uh, and, or a non-invasive treatment. So you agree that um, risk stratification is a must? Yeah. Okay. So let's have the evidence. The evidence is risk stratification is class one indication in every guidelines for any patient presenting with an acute coronary syndrome, whether it's unstable angina, non-STEMI or STEMI. This is a class one indication. Whatever this patient has a stable or, hem or hemo hemodynamically stable uh, status. So, Yes, we need a risk stratification, which is a class one indication by guidelines. Risk stratification here will benefit the balance between the ischemia and bleeding and will control our management strategy, procedure treatment, uh, uh, and the long-term treatment. So risk stratification is extremely beneficial in every step of our dealing with this patient. So why do we fear from bleeding? Because in any acute coronary syndrome patient, we are loading the patient with multiple blood thinners, antiplatelets, anticoagulation, if we need glycoprotein 2 B3 inhibitors. So we have every um, reason to fear from bleeding in these patients, especially if they have multiple comorbidities. And how to stratify this patient? We have a lot of uh, scores. Preset score, risk score for bleeding, risk score for ischemia, and precise depth and depth scores for managing the, the patient with dual antiplatelet therapy. 
Of course, Abdurrahman elegantly showed the uh, crusade risk, uh, the GRACE score, uh, which includes the age, the heart failure, the systolic blood pressure, the condition of the patient regarding the heart failure, creatinine, if he has renal failure, if he has any uh, ST segment derangement, cardiac arrest or not, and elevated biomarkers, especially troponin. And if we calculate this patient, this patient has a 15% probability of death from admission to six months. And the GRACE score is 139, which is a little bit a tricky uh, uh, number, with one, 140, the cutoff point of very high risk patients and the high risk to intermediate risk patients. And in hospital major bleeding, which is a very, very important uh, risk, especially in these patients, risk score, We've calculated uh, the crusade bleeding risk score, and with no doubt, this patient has a very high risk for bleeding. So uh, this patient has a high risk uh, concerning the non stemi and a very high risk for bleeding. So what do you think is the treatment strategy, Dr. Abdullah, and the audience, of course? Yeah, I think here, uh, uh, if we if we have uh, uh, to risk stratify, this patient uh, will go for early invasive. Okay. Any other opinion? Anyone is awake or uh... maybe they are muted? Yeah, I, I want to make sure that they are awake. <laughs> and uh, our dazzling away did not put them in, uh, into sleep. Everyone's awake, actually, and enthusiastic. I just was checking how it's going on YouTube Live. It's going perfect, actually. We have lots of international friends following us and giving me very positive feedback. So you are rocking the stage, guys. Just continue what you are doing. You're doing it perfectly. Okay. So we have, we have criteria for very high-risk patients high risk patient and intermediate risk patient. And these criteria must be in mind when dealing with an acute coronary syndrome patient. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, if he has a recurrent or ongoing chest pain, life-threatening arrhythmia, mechanical complications, acute heart failure or recurrent dynamic STT wave changes, this patient must be took to the fast track and rushed to the uh, uh, cath lab. Other the high risk patient has a GRACE score of 140 or above, dynamic STT wave changes and rise of troponin. So our patient lies in the high risk category, which means that this patient will, will go an early invasive strategy within 24 hours, as uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah said. So, this is a repeated slide. What about the antiplatelet uh, uh, of this patient? We have clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or prasugrel. So which are our options in this patient? Despite- I think here that, we have- uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have two options only, not three. <laughs> yeah. And why is that? Because, because of the age, first, uh, yeah. Because of the age, because uh, this patient had a prior stroke, which is a contraindication for prasugrel. Yeah. And yeah. this patient, uh, we didn't check the weight of this patient. If she has a low body weight below 60 kilogram, this will be another contraindication for prasugrel. So yeah. we have now two options for antiplatelet, either clopidogrel or ticagrelor. As we always do the balance between the ischemia, the ischemia and the bleeding risk, we will choose between the, these two agents uh, regarding the efficiency and the safety. The only solid large data we have now, or the, the most prevailed one, is the PLATO trial, which showed um, that, that the ticagrelor is superior to clopidogrel regarding the antiplatelet activity, in every uh, single uh, entity of sub uh, patients, 
including diabetics, including uh, patients with previous stroke, early and with renal impairment. This is the ischemic efficiency. But I must know the safety of the, uh, of, uh, the ticagrelor. The ticagrelor had no uh, uh, significant uh, bleeding, major bleeding over clopidogrel in also these particular entity of patients, either elderly, uh, diabetics, renal impairment, or previous stroke. So, and that's why the guidelines in a high-risk patient did uh, state that we can use uh, aspirin and clopidogrel or aspirin and ticagrelor based on the uh, PLATO trial. So we'll choose ticagrelor. And what about anticoagulation? This is a very, very important um, uh, entity or a very important step because when we are enthusiastic to rush this patient to the uh, cath lab, sometimes in the ER or in the initial management of these patients, they forgot to administer anticoagulation for this patient. But anticoagulation uh, strategy largely depends on the strategy, either co uh, conservative or invasive, should consider the bleeding risk. We should know the pre-treated uh, uh, pre status of the patient before uh, it reaches our hospital or our center because it can, uh, the patient can have anticoagulation in the other hospital or in the uh, ambulance and the renal function of this patient because uh, some of the anticoagulation agents require renal very a uh, quick um, concept of the about, about treatment, uh, treatment, uh, treatment if the patient is not pretreated, the treatment during PCI should be bivalirudin or unfractionated heparin. If he's pretreated with enoxaparin, continue with enoxaparin. If he is pretreated with fundaparinox, give treatment of unfractionated heparin. And if he's pretreated with unfractionated heparin, go to bivalirudin or continue in unfractionated heparin inside the cath lab. If he's pre-treated with enoxaparin, continue with enoxaparin. If he is pre-treated with fundaparinox, give treatment of unfractionated heparin. And if he is pre-treated with unfractionated heparin, continue with or continue in unfractionated heparin inside the cath lab. Okay. So our patient here lies in the uh, CKD stage three with uh, no um, renal adjustment of enoxaparin, fundaparinox, or bivalirudin, of course, and unfractionated heparin, so you can give any uh, of these agents. Hi, Sam, can I ask a question, please? Please do. Um, so you, uh, you, you, you're prescribing the, your patient uh, dual antiplatelet and anticoagulant. And uh, for me, I need to know uh, what is uh, your primary strategy? Is it invasive uh, strategy or conservative strategy for this patient? Uh, according to the risk stratification we, we, we've did for this patient in particular, we are going for an early invasive strategy within 24 hours because this patient is a high risk patient. Okay, so you decided to go to an early invasive strategy despite the age and the frailty because this patient is a high risk. Yes. Okay. Mind okay. you, the intraprocedural use of low molecular weight heparin depends on uh, the pretreatment. If we pre-treated pre our patient less than eight hours, there is no additional dose required inside the cath lab. If it's from eight hour to uh, 12 hours, an additional 0.3 milligram per kg intravenous bolus is required, and more than 12 hours, a full anticoagulation is required inside the cath lab during intervention. Okay, Isam, we have a, 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 another question or another discussion in the chat about the use of ticagrelor in the patient, uh, in the elderly patient uh, and the frail patient. Yeah. And 
most of us are, uh, are conservative regarding the use of uh, ticagrelor in this uh, type of patient. What do you think? Um, this uh, slide in, uh, answer it, uh, my friend. Uh, this is uh, from the, play, the PLATO trial. We have no significant difference in major bleeding between ticagrelor and clopidogrel in these particular patients, the elderly patients, the patient with renal impairment, diabetic patients, and patient with uh, a prior stroke. So uh, we are benefiting from the uh, superior antiplatelet activity of ticagrelor with actually no uh, significant difference between it and clopidogrel concerning the safety of major bleeding. Uh, may I ask another question, Hyson, please? Please do. Uh, uh, this slide of uh, Plato trial, uh, each one of us know it will, but uh, in real life, uh, uh, what are you doing uh, by yourself, Hyson? Uh, if your patient is 80 years old, frail patient, okay, uh, 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 do you really gi give her uh, ticagrelor? Yeah, I give her ticagrelor. Okay, and you uh, continue uh, for uh, uh, a full duration, uh, uh, one year or six months. This is this is the last step of the presentation, so be uh -huh. patient. Okay, okay. Because um, if you are going to uh, the risk certification, this is the last step of the risk certification. Okay, excellent. Okay. So uh, mind you that uh, the use of glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitor is strictly to a bailout strategy, and it's not recommended to administer glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitor in patients with whom coronary anatomy is not known. So the use of glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitor is strictly to a patient in the cath lab with a large thrombus burden as a bailout procedure or bailout situation. Okay. And of course, if we're going to use a glycoprotein 2B3 AA, mind the renal function of the patient because it uh, requires uh, renal adjustment. So this is your question, Abdurrahman, the, the duration of the antiplatelet therapy. We have two steps to decide uh, whether uh, what's the duration of antiplatelet therapy of our patients. Yes. The first one is the precise DAT score at the time of coronary stenting or coronary intervention. Yes. And the other step is the DAT score after 12 months. Yes. Uh, of course, if we uh, pass the first step. So if we, uh, the, in the first step, we are calculating whether this patient is suitable for a full uh, antiplatelet duration, dual antiplatelet duration of 12 months, which is the conventional uh, duration or yes. a shorter duration due to high bleeding risk. Yes. Depending on the hemoglobin, white disease, age, creatinine clearance, prior bleeding, and um, we calculate the score. If it's above 25, we will go to a short depth. If it's below 25, standard gap. And it goes without saying that any patient above 25, we will not look uh, to the adapt score um, uh, anymore, this patient will have a short duration of, uh, of depth with no adaption of the depth score. So we've calculated the precise depth score of this patient, and it's not a surprise that she has a high uh, precise depth score of uh, 47. So this patient will have a shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy of six months, which is a plus 2A in the guidelines, uh, followed by a single uh, antiplatelet therapy, which is preferably a P2Y12 uh, inhibitor. So, uh, and uh, the preferred P2Y12 inhibitor, if there is no uh, bleeding uh, during these six months and the patient is okay, is the reduced dose of the ticagrelor, which is 60 milligram twice per day. And if you're thinking about frailty and uh, whether we can decrease the bleeding risk of the patient or not, and this is mentioned elegantly in your presentation, especially by Dr. Ahmed Shawi, uh, is to try to do uh, your uh, job via radial approach and not 
uh, via femoral approach, uh, this will decrease the periprocedural bleeding and decrease the risk of complication of your patient. So treatment plan of this patient is early invasive radial approach with uh, uh, DES, short depth with ticagrelor 90 milligram twice and aspirin 81 milligram, enoxaparin as anticoagulation pre and during procedure. So before take home message, do anyone have any comments? Go ahead, Abdul. Yeah, I have, a, I have a, just a question outside the guidelines. If you have a, a polymer free stent like BioFreedom, would you prefer to insert it in this patient? In order, if you have any uh, emergency that needs to you to stop the dual antiplatelet therapy at any time, you can stop? Uh, yeah, it's preferable to, to use it. And there is also several trials now about um, uh, other DES not only the polymer free uh, DS that we can stop the dual antiplatelet therapy within one to three months. So it's wise uh, to, to use it uh, in order to be more safe with our patients. But mind you, the dual antiplatelet therapy uh, is not only in these patients, is not only for stents, it's for the, it's acute, for the acute coronary syndrome, syndrome itself. So uh, unless necessary and unless it's life threatening, we must continue on dual antiplatelet therapy for the six months uh, duration for the acute coronary syndrome and not for the DS. Yeah. So to summarize, risk stratification is very important in managing acute coronary syndrome. Choosing potent antiplatelet and its duration depends upon both ischemia and bleeding risk. Radial approach to decrease bleeding risk is essential, especially in vulnerable patients. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank so, you much, so much, uh, Dr. Haysam uh, Abdullah. I would like to uh, sum up uh, the second half of the session in two to three minutes and give us uh, the most important learning points, if you please. Yeah, the most important learning point from this case is uh, one of them is uh, the same form from the first case is to risk stratify. Risk stratify every patient with non ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And according to the risk stratification, you uh, should go for the next step. Uh, the second point is how to choose uh, the antiplatelet and how to decide the duration of antiplatelet, uh, depending on both scores, as Dr. Heisem said. And the third one, uh, as uh, this patient is uh, very old, has very high risk of bleeding, is to uh, risk, uh, risk uh, uh, stratify the bleeding risk of the patient also in order to decrease the bleeding risk do every uh, single uh, step that can reduce the bleeding in these patients that's all Karim, do you have any questions out there that you would like us uh, to tackle here from the YouTube channel or from your own uh, experiences? Um, just one comment, uh, excellent case, hi, Sam. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to stress, uh, stress on the, we should know uh, the glomerular filtration rate for every patient presenting with uh, non-ST acute coronary syndrome, especially if, the, uh, if, if it has a risk profile such as uh, your uh, patient. This will affect uh, the, every management step, the revascularization, right. the dose adjustment of the drugs, uh, even the bleeding risk. So uh, the GFR and knowing the condition of uh, the patient kidneys are crucial step in the management of this kind of patient. That's right. And that's why I, am, I was stressing about um, the presence of creatinine clearance of this patient in the first uh, slide, in the background of the patient, because it's very, very important, as you said, to know the creatinine clearance of this patient. This will depend um, upon it in every step, as you said. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Haysam. Uh, thank you so much, Abdullah, for the excellent moderation. Uh, I would like to thank Abrahman uh, for the first uh, part of the session. 
I would like to extend my uh, thankness to Professor Shawi from the, my deepest point of my heart, actually, for joining us today. We learn a lot from him. He's a very eminent uh, teacher and professor for all of us. Thank you, Hasib, uh, for joining us from IAC uh, and Abdullah as well. Uh, Khalid Shams uh, is most welcome. And all our friends that joined us on YouTube, uh, our partners, uh, scientific partners from IAC, uh, thank you so much for everyone. And just uh, you can, uh, this, uh, this session now has been recorded on YouTube. So it's actually there. Uh, you can watch it and access just free by uh, clicking on the link. Uh, and uh, usually we will fix this session to be on the Thursdays. Probably the next session will be managing the bleeding risk uh, in specific uh, categories of patients. Will be presented by an eminent speaker also, but it's going to be a surprise. So we'll just announce it uh, two days before. Uh, we are waiting for your uh, support and we are waiting for your feedback uh, to improve ourselves regarding every particular point. As I said previously, this is not my channel. This is not our channel. This is your channel. This is everyone's channel. Uh, you can join us at any time. You can propose your ideas for improvement. Uh, and uh, we wish to see you all in the best health and the best shape. Uh, thank you so much and uh, see you next week. Bye. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Haysam. Thank you, Mohammed Zahran, and everyone. Many thanks to Abdullah and to Dr. Uh, Professor Ahmed Wish thank to you. see thank you soon. Thank you, dear. Thank you. And thank you to Professor Ahmed, Ahmed Shawi. It was an honor. Thank you, dear Abdullah. You're a great friend and supporter. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.